I'm, I'm, I'm for, it's our church and they need to be involved. And, you know, one day we'll have the video cams and all the sound equipment and all this. And we'll have all the teenagers man that because they need to know that they belong in this church, part of their church. So we've been sharing from Matthew and we know that we're working through, I think, I think we are now almost a year and a half in Matthew. Something like that. Because we're just going systematically through the book of Matthew. I like that because it, it just, I know um, we're not jumping around. So Matthew 16, we are now in Matthew 16 from verse 5. And up until this point, what has happened is Jesus has done miracles and wonders and signs. And, na, 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 na. and in Matthew 16 from verse 1 to 4, the Pharisees and the Sadducees say, please give us another sign. We want to see a sign from heaven. He says, La, the week before last week. Did you guys enjoy Robbie? Yeah. Huh? I love that man there. So um, the week before last week, uh, we, we spoke about the sign, and the only sign that he'll give is that of Jonah, that he will go into the belly of the whale. No, that's the sign that he gave. So they are walking away from that now. Jesus just spoke to them, and then he says the following. In verse 5, Now when... His disciples had come to the other side. They had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned amongst themselves, saying, It is because we've not taken bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O oh, you little of faith, why do you reason amongst yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves or the 5,000, how many baskets you took up, nor the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets you took up. How is it that you do not understand that I do not speak to you concerning bread, but to be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees? Then they understood that he did not tell them to be aware of the leaven of the bread, but the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So a couple of weeks ago, Jesus was talking about bread and leaven again. Remember a couple of weeks ago, and we had that leavened bread and unleavened bread, and it was hard, and we were all that. And I was like, Lord, you're doing the same thing again. And what do I talk about? I need a different message. I need, you know, this is difficult. Because if God repeats it, it's important. Does that make sense? Amen. If he repeats it, it's important. You know, when you tell your child, don't go near the plug. Don't go near the plug. That's kind of important. And if he goes there and gets choked. So, so Jesus said this because it's important, but also he knows the end from the beginning. Do you agree with me when I say that? That Jesus knew even then about today. And he's not talking about leaven. Now, what does leaven do to dough? Just quickly, I like this part. I like it. I got excited when I read this. It makes it grow with what? Hot air. It blows it up so it seems bigger than it is. And that's what it does. It blows it up with hot air. Now, the Pharisees and the Sadducees do have a bad reputation. However, they didn't start off in a very bad place. They started off in a kind of good place because they come out of the tribe of Levi, which the priesthood came from. So the Pharisees... What is their doctrine that Jesus is saying, whoa, watch out. Watch out for this doctrine. What is this? The Sadducees, what's their doctrine that we need to watch out for? And then there's another group that's also there, which I'm going to show you now. So first of all, the Pharisees came from the Levites. The Levites, remember now, Moses, Aaron, and, 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 and that whole tribe, they were the ones ministering before the Lord. They were the ones ministering there. And over time, they became exclusive. They became the authority. They became the position of power. Flesh. I want to tell you something. If, if, let's say we're praying for somebody, and God is touching somebody, and they're crying. Don't go put your flesh to that. The Holy Spirit's already doing His work. You don't have to do anything. I'm going to put your hands on them. God's already, why must I do anything? God's already doing something. The Lord's already moving in somebody. You don't have to add flesh to that. The Pharisees, came, the Pharisees came and they added flesh to that in their thinking and they started becoming exclusive. 
There's exclusivity. Church is for everybody. Church is not for the people that look like me, act like me, dress like me. Church actually exists for those who are far away from God. That's what church is for. Church is for the weirdos, the LGBTQs. Church is for the lost. Jesus came for the lost. He didn't come for the healthy. Doc, doctor doesn't come for He comes for the sick. So the, the leaven of the Pharisees, they started to think too much about themselves. They started getting blown up with hot air. They become exclusive. And within that exclusivity, they started misinterpreting the doctrine of predestination. The doctrine of predestination is not for salvation. It's for works. You can go read Romans 9. It's for works. You and I are predestined to do works. With that comes free will. You can choose to walk in that free will, in those good works by your free will, or choose not to. Maybe you have got a gift of singing. I just want to know, just put up your hand if you can sing. Who's got a nice voice? There's a, there's, okay. Do you know that you're supposed to walk in that good works? Now, I'm not manipulating you at all. I'm just taking an example. Né? If your will doesn't go there, you're just not walking in it. But you're predestined. Because God's not confused that you see what beautiful singing voice he gave me. God knew he can't give me a beautiful singing voice because then I'll do everything. Né? I shall sing. And if I could dance, I would dance. But I can't. I can just talk. So, you can just talk. You see, and th this leaven, this doctrine has permeated into churches where they believe in the predestination with, for salvation. That Jesus didn't die for everybody, he died for, spe for specific people. Okay? So now comes the question. This doctrine, how do I then know that I'm predestined to be saved? Oh, that's easy because you're here with us. Can you hear the exclusivity? Can you hear the separation? Because you're here with us, now you are predestined to be saved. So Lord, why am I doing what I'm doing? How do I know that I'm predestined to be saved? Or which of my two sons that you're predestined to be saved? Which one, which one must I pray for and the other one must I just write off because he wasn't predestined to be saved? Does that make sense? The exclusivity of this doctrine started happening. The doctrine of the Pharisees started drawing people. Jesus died on the cross for everybody. For God so loved the world. Everybody. That whoever believes in Him will be saved. It's the will of God that all men be saved, not just some. You see, even the positioning of the church can start working in exclusivity. It's us group of friends. This is our family's church. Exclusivity. No, it's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hello? The exclusivity goes further. I'm a Presbyterian. I'm a Methodist. I'm a Levender Word. I got my church. You know the people, I got my church. Exclusivity. No, we are brothers and sisters. We are brothers and sisters. So that's the doctrine. Now, the Sadducees, just go with, follow me with the scriptures, okay? Okay. So I want to show you from scripture the Pharisees, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said unto them, You offspring of vipers. Who has warned you to flee from the wrath of God? So, I mean, is Je I want to know, is Jesus perfect? Okay. You didn't say that aloud, did you? Is Jesus perfect? Okay. He calls people children of snakes. How, 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 how kind is that to feelings? Your past is long, man. How kind is that to your 
feelings, emotions. In a world where we live in, where we're so consumed about people's feelings. Don't be offensive. Don't offend them. Oh, you're going to hurt my feelings. I got so hurt. <laughs> Jesus is perfect. Does he care about their feelings right now? Because who warned you, you bunch of black mambas? You know? You know what we do with snakes now? Kwachak. Kap se kop af. Jesus is not concerned about the feeling, yet he remains perfect. Because he's talking about the doctrine. He's saying, you have gone into a doctrine that is misled, deceived. Because that's what the snake did. He deceived God's children. You see, this deception that comes with their doctrine. And King David said, call to me. No, no, you're too fast. <laughs> Thank you. So, does the... Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Sadducees, thank you, I just was looking for the word Sadducees. The Sadducees, nee, 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 terug. don't change when I look down. <laughs> okay. The Sadducees came from a, a priest called Zadok. Okay. And King David said, call to me Zadok, the priest, Nathan, the prophet, and the rest of them. I can't pronounce those names. Okay. So, can you see that the Sadducees came from a good place? They came from priests. Another scripture says they were the only ones that weren't deceived in a certain time, was the Sadducees. They remained faithful to God, serving in His temple. Okay, go to the next one. Thank you. That the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected for themselves the counsel of God, being not baptized of Him. So that word lawyers there, okay, is also scribes. This is the third group that's hidden in the scripture, the scribes. So the scribes have been coming along all the while, writing down what the laws are, the prophets are, Moses. They're scribing it. They're writing it down. And then they became a authority on their own because they've now written it down a couple of times. And they've duplicated. So now they know what's happening. And they become legalistic. So now, so first of all, we looked at the, the doctrine of the Pharisees. The one thing that's standing out. We're going to look now at the contrast between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the doctrine of the scribes was a legalistic doctrine. For instance... You must wear a hat to church. If you don't wear a hat, you're unholy. Oh, 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 oh. You must observe the Sabbath from Friday night, 6 o'clock, until Saturday night, 6 o'clock. And if you don't do that, you're not cutting it. You see, if you want to live by the law, you must live by all of them. If you fail in one, you are guilty of the punishment of all of them. Because the same one, God, that gave one law, gave all of them. So if you break one of them, you've broken the whole law. So the scribes would say, no, that's not the law. Become legalistic. No, that's legal. You understand now? So we've got the puffed up. One side, exclusive, self-righteous, almost, predestined, and on the other side, legalistic. The Sadducees are in the middle. Okay, so we can go to that next scripture, please. And there came to him a certain Sadducee that say there is no resurrection. Go to the next scripture, please. For well, the Sadducees say there is no resurrection. Neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. So, the Pharisees are saying there is a resurrection that's going to happen one day. The Sadducees know there's not going to be no resurrection. Okay. What's the outflow of that doctrine? Speak to people. So, what's going to happen when you die? No, I just go into the ground. 
Can you hear what, where this, that's the Sadducee. Can you hear? The Sadducee is talking. The doctrine of the Sadducee, that leaven has come through the generations. Oh, if you die, it's over. The Dover. Finished and clock. Where the Pharisees say there is a resurrection. Jesus says, I am the resurrection. So there is a resurrection. Amen. There is a resurrection. The Sadducees are wrong. The Pharisees are right. Um, neither angel. If I say there's no angels, then there can be no fallen angel. Are you following? A couple of years ago, a very big denomination in our country brought, brought together a huge inquisition to study whether there is a devil or not. <laughs> can you believe it? And they've come to the conclusion there's no devil. Good. So who's your enemy? Then flesh becomes your enemy. If there's no power and principality and rulers in the darkness, if there's no spirit in the air of this air, if there's no God of this universe, that's all the descriptions of Satan, by the way, if, then you and I don't have an enemy and flesh becomes my enemy. And yet the Word of God says, we walk where not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and rulers in the darkness. So no enemy is, no person, no flesh is my enemy. Whether I dance on the stage and, or whether I create gas chambers, flesh is not our enemy. It's the spirit behind it. Doesn't make sense. Now we can bring it closer to home where we have people that don't like us or people that speak bad about us or we get persecuted from a different place for, di for different reasons, for our gender, for what we stand for, for the color of our skin, um, for being conservative, for being binary. You've got people coming against you. They're not your enemy. It's the spirit behind that that's your enemy. Now, the, no, no, don't go. Stay there, please. The Sadducees saying there's no angel, so there's no fallen angel. There's no spirit. That means you don't have a spirit. God is spirit, and he made us in his image. So if there's no spirit, then there's no God. And the worship of God is an intellectual exercise that does not matter, because when you die, you decompose. And that's the end of the story. And that leads to atheism. Beware of the doctrine of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And we know that there are angels. We know that God commands his angels. We don't pray to angels. And please, you don't command the angels. It's not your job. You don't have to say, dear Lord Jesus, please tell your angels. No, that's not the prayer. You, you go to the Father and say, Father, thank you for my protection. I trust in you, sir. That's all you need. And I do it in Jesus' name. Because you cannot come to the Father except through the Son. And if you reject the son, you reject the father. End of funny story, end of story, lights out, home to Jerome. That's it. The rest is history. You have to, that's the only way. You don't, oh God, because you know what happens? We get hung up on angels. And now we've got little statues. And the next thing, we've got little saints that we make. And next thing, we've got, we got things around our neck. Going to mantras. And next thing, we're burning incense. The gat jy. By the time you realize that you're off the cliff, poof, and all I can think of is the load runner. Whee! Amen. Now gat Hence the Lord say, you will make no images of anything that's in heaven or on the sea or on earth. Don't go into the mermaids and the unicorns. Don't. It will lead you astray. Nor spirit. If God is spirit, made us in this, we are spirit. Sadducees had it wrong. The Pharisees had it right. The Pharisees are losing it because they're coming to this whole puffed up thing. 
And the scribes are writing it down. That's not law. That's not law. That's not law. You're wrong. You're wrong. Throwing the law at you the whole time, the whole time. Can you see how that permeates through different churches? To the place where they say, all right, let's have you baptized and get you saved. Baptism does not save you. Categorically. Baptism is an outflow of an inner work of the Holy Spirit in your heart that has renewed you and made you new. And now you want to tell the world and the spiritual realm that I reconcile myself with the life, the, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm going to the water grave. You're going to bury me once, please. Ne? Don't bury me twice. <laughs> I'm dying once. Hello? <laughs> Can do it, yeah, can do it, yeah. Once, and then resurrected the life that I now live. It's not me that lives, but Christ that lives within me. Amen. It's easy, it's plain, it's, we don't have to get confused about it. And now we don't have to run around and argue with one another. But it's, remember, the Bible is not written for intellectuals. It's written for children. Because God deals with us as children. So if, we, if it's written for intellectuals, we miss it completely. And then we want to get an inquisition going to research if there's a devil. Or do we have an enemy? So I had an interesting conversation with an old school friend of mine. That, what I've said now is an intro because worth that comes, but what doctrine do we have to follow? So... This message can be titled one of two things. What is the, what's the exact doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Or who is Jesus really? So we had a very interesting conversation. And I like having conversations with unsaved people. I love having those conversations. Because now I know what's going on in their world, in their worldview, and in their mind, and how they think. I know what we believe. But how do I sharpen my sword to speak to somebody if I don't know where they're coming from? So we had a long conversation, and he makes the statement that the problem began when we, man, made God, the Almighty, into man. And I'm like, because in the conversation I was challenged, because he's going God, 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 God. And you all know how I feel about that. Hey, God, God, who's God? God, 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 God. Who is he? What's his name? God, 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 God. God is a title. Are you following? God is a title. The God of Islam is Allah. The God of the occult is Lucifer, Satan. You call him what you want. The God of the us, Jesus. All right? We'll walk about it theologically. I will get there. Walk with me. Okay. That's the name given above all other names by which we... Romans 10, verse 8, 9, 10. If you confess that Jesus is Lord, what does the word Lord mean? God. The Lord, your God. Okay, so that's the name given by which we are saved. Every tongue will confess and every knee will bow and say that Jesus is Lord. Lord. Okay, so can you see the name that's given unto us? Does that make sense? So I can't walk around... God this, God that, God this, God that. I was like, who are you talking about? So I was speaking to my friend. And he's God this, God that, God this. God. And I'm like, I'm challenged, yeah. And I can hear the Lord say, are you going to be ashamed of my name? And I had to work through a couple of things in my heart of hearts. And I got to the conclusion while I was speaking, you can do nothing for me. And Jesus has done everything for me. So I said, we have to get to a place where we understand that God is a title and his name is Jesus. <laughs> it breaks. You can just hear him. Yeah, but the problem is when man made God into the image of man. I want you to get this. You and I can never exalt to God. We can never lift ourselves up to be like God. We can try, but you'll never make it. 
That's what the Lord just came to show us, that you cannot be like God because God is 100% perfect and holy. And neither can we bring God down. We can't. You don't have the ability to take the Almighty and put Him in a box. So who's Jesus? First scripture, please. There we go. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship Him. Who's that? Jesus, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. Jesus is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He's not a plan B. Adam, what are we going to do with you? God is all-knowing. He knows every single thing. He knew Adam and Eve was going to stuff up. He knew it. So it wasn't a plan B. Okay, son, you must now go die. No, no. When the creation happened, the son said, I'll die. He's the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. God himself chose to come down and be like man. The next one. Um, Who art thou, O Lord and our God? To receive the glory and the honor and the power for thou didst create all things. And because of thy will they were created and were created. Jesus is the creator. He's not the creation. He is creator. Everything that was created was created by Jesus. There's the scripture. One, he created all things. Because of his will they were created and They were and were created. And then you go to John 1. In the beginning. In the beginning. In the beginning. Was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And He created everything. Go read it. I'm giving you a paraphrase now. And He created everything. Genesis 1 verse 1. There's Jesus. Creating. He is the creator. All right, next one. Uh, yeah. In the end of that, this is the next thing that Jesus is. Jesus is the express image of the Father. Okay. And the end of, no, 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 boss, you know. Yeah, these they spoken unto us, who appointed heir of all things, to whom also he made the worlds. Another scripture that confirms that Jesus made the worlds. Okay, who in be, being the if a, can, who can pronounce that for me? My tongue knurped. Who being the of his glory and the very image of his substance. So when you look at Jesus, you see the Father. So this is where, and I have taught you this, and I'll to say it again, I'll preach it again, the difference between human personality and divine personality. Human personality, you're going to come close up to me, you're going to smell my garlic from last night, and you're going to see the chip in my tooth. You're going to see that when you get close to me. And in my personality, the closer you walk to me, the more you're going to see my character flaws. You're going to see what's wrong with me. You're going to see... Where I fall short, that's when you... Now, some people can't handle walking close to me. Because then they get into the place where they take their eyes off the Lord and they start looking at a man. Okay? So now you're looking at me and you're comparing what? Flesh with flesh. Your weakness with my weakness and your strengths with my strengths. Or your strengths with my weaknesses. And now you start criticizing. You've taken your eyes off the Lord. Put your eyes back on the Lord. Look at Him. One of my mentors that taught me how to read the Bible, taught me how to pray, that taught me how to interpret Scripture. Him and his wife got divorced. Today he's living with another woman. He's not married. He has, he drinks some wine. He doesn't overindulge. I've got all the honor and respect for him in the world. You see, that's why I'm not mentioning his name. Because he taught me, don't take your eyes off the Lord. Don't look at me. I will fail you. You keep your eyes on God. Lift your eyes to the Lord. Say, Lord, I look at you. 
Because this man here in front of you will fail you. That's human personality. Divine personality is the closer you come to Jesus, the more perfect he is. You see, from afar off, he's just another man that lived 2,000 years ago. He's just a rabbi, maybe a prophet, a good person. Does that sound familiar? Do you hear people talk like that? Because they're far off. They're standing way, 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 way. They've not come close to Jesus to see who he is. Because the closer you come to him, the more divine and the more holy he becomes. Because you start seeing it in him. You see, the feminist would say, but it's a patriarchal system. But you move closer. The first Adam, he formed with clay. And he blew the ruach, the breath of life, into the clay. And it became alive. And clay became man. Could he do it again? Yes. Yet he chose when the last Adam, Jesus, came to be born of a woman. He chose that. What's he saying? I value woman. And when he got resurrected, who's the first person he appears to? A woman. And when he fights for, for women's rights, when the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes are there, say, stone her, she's been caught in adultery. It's difficult to be caught in adultery alone. But stone her. He goes and he draws his hand in the ground and says, no, you has no sin. You cast the first stone. Is that patriarchal? No. See, that's how the doctrine of the other three starts permeating through and people say, no, it's a patriarchal, it's toxic masculinity. Real masculinity protects, it's not toxic. Who existed in the form of God. So what happened, Jesus, just put the scripture on top there, it's not in there. Who existed in the form of God counted not being on an equal with God as a thing to be grasped. So what that means is God the Father is over here. Jesus is right next to him. He is not below him. He's not less than him. He is there who existed in the form of God, counting not being an, on an equal with God, a thing to be grasped. Next verse. But he, Jesus, emptied himself of what? His omnipresence and omniscience, having all power and on being everywhere at the same time, knowing everything. He emptied his city. I lay it down. I put it on the shelf. I'm taking what I am and all my power. I put it, leave it, and I go in, take the form of a human servant. Okay, being made in the likeness of men. Why? So that you and I can get him. Because his ways are almost higher than our ways. And his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So how are we going to get him? How are we going to understand him? How are we going to grasp him? We're going to have to go through experiential learning all the time of the 2,000 years or 4,000 years in the Old Testament or 2,000 years, it's 4,000 years in the Old Testament, 4,000 years in the Old Testament, where people had to experientially learn who God is. Until God provided a ram in the bush, he never called God my provider. Remember when he did that? When he had the knife to stab his son. God says, look up, there's a ram. You provide for me, Lord. The Lord my provider. Does it make sense? That's experiential learning. God comes down and he starts saying, hey, now you can get me. And being found in a fashion of man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient. Jesus became obedient to earthly parents and to his heavenly father, even unto death, the death of the cross. So he didn't count it as a loss to descend. He became like us. We didn't make him smaller. You see, the closer I come to him, the more divine he is. Okay, next one. 
Whereas God has highly exalted him and gave unto him the name which is above every name. So Jesus is the exalted one. He is the one that we're going to worship in the image of. Isaiah 9 verse 6 and 7. That's Isaiah 7. But leave it there, leave it there. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. You see, I wish you people can understand what's going on in the attack on the divinity of Christ. Because if we or the humankind can break the divinity of Christ, our salvation is gone. Because there had to be a perfect lamb to die for our sins. And no human can be perfect. So God divinely came and lived in man. Daniel pens down the following phrase. That's not nowhere in the Bible, but in Daniel. Then I said, behold, something or someone like the Son of Man. And then Jesus comes and he says, I am the Son of Man. I am the Son of Man. No one else writes it. No one else pins it. No one else says that. As Daniel writes in a vision, the Son of Man, Jesus comes and says, I am the Son of Man. I am born of a virgin. The virgin birth is a reality. It is part of the divinity of who Christ is. It's the Spirit of God. You see, there's two spirits inside of you. You know that. It's your spirit and the Holy Spirit. Okay? Within Jesus, it was the Spirit of God inside of him. It's the Spirit of God in flesh. He's Emmanuel, God with us. Unto us is born a child. We shall call him Wonderful Counselor, Prince, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's Jesus. He's the divinity. The question, the challenge that I want to place with you today is that does your life reflect who Christ really is? You see, because the closer we get to him, the more of his glory comes off of us. Does that make sense? And we start reflecting who he is. And the world can see that he is who he says he is. He's not a madman that said, I am, quoting Moses. When Moses said, Lord, who must I say send me? Tell him, I am, send you. Here comes Jesus and asking, who are you? He said, I am. I am the son of man. He says to him, I was before Abraham. Remember when he spoke those words? He says, God is able to raise up children for Abraham, but I came before Abraham. Does your life reflect that? Or can we walk closer to Jesus and see how more perfect and more beautiful he is? Can we go closer to him? Because if not, when we are far off, we have to constantly be on our guard for the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. Constantly. But when we come close to Jesus, when we ride close to him, we don't have to worry about that. Because our eyes are on him. He who stands in the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 91. He who stands in the shadow of the Almighty. I want to ask you a question. 1 John says, God is light and in him there's no darkness. How does light have shadow? It doesn't. Light there's no shadow. So when I stand in the shadow of the Almighty... I'm standing in the brilliance of his glory. And what happens if you look at bright light after a while? 
That's why we must don't, don't look at the sun. You must go stare at the sun the whole day long. A eh? couple of seconds, you close your eyes, it's too strong. You see, when we stand in the brightness and the glory of God, people start seeing the glory of God and they don't see your flaws. You're covered, you're protected. However, the glory of God, the light of God permeates your whole being and none of your flaws are hidden from Him. None of it. But He remembers who you are. He remembers that you are clay, that you are but ground, that you are flawed. That he does not treat you and I according to our iniquities or our sins. He is slow to anger, rich in love, full of grace and mercy. And forgives. He forgives us when we stand in his light. Because his light shines in our heart and we say, Lord, this is who I am. I'm sorry. I am like this. Forgive me. And he forgives. And then he says, Come closer. I'll remove it from you. As far as the east is from the west. Come closer. Come closer. Come look in my eyes. And I will come over you like I came over Moses in that tabernacle of gathering, the tent of gathering with the cloud, my glory upon you. And now people can say, I see the Lord. My life reflects the glory of God. Would you stand? I want to bless you as we go. If you want prayer, you're more than welcome after service to come forward. The ministry team will be here to pray with you. Will you have your hands in the receiving mode, please? Father, Without arrogance, Lord, we just come with humility before you and as ambassador of the kingdom of heaven. Because your word says in 2 Corinthians 5, Lord, that we are ambassadors for Christ. I come and pronounce the blessing from heaven. Your blessing. May you experience this week the love of our Lord God. The grace of Jesus Christ. And the intimate fellowship of the Holy Spirit, reminding you of His words, His love, His grace, His mercy upon you. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Let's go have some coffee. If you want prayer, you're welcome to come to the front. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm